Would you turn with me in your Bible to uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses, we're going to be considering verses 10 through 13 this morning. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13 from the New King James Bible, the New King James Version. This is what it says. The Apostle Paul is writing, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now, at last, your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatso whatever state I'm in to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is the word of God. This morning, I want to spend a few minutes on a tough subject. I want to tag this text, learning or lessons on learning to be content. Lessons on learning to be content. I need you to hang with me this morning. In this text, we find that the key thought is contentment. And that thought dominates all four verses that were read this morning. And it provides the central theme of what we want to say this morning. In the context of this text, contentment means to be free from care because of satisfaction with what is already one's own. In other words, to be free from care because you are satisfied with what you have, where you are, and who you are. Now listen carefully. The discipline of contentment is neither simple nor superficial to acquire or in its application. Contentment is a serious discipline that you cannot, we cannot perfect on our own. Achieving contentment requires supernatural power. Contentment can be realized in the life of a believer only through the strength that comes from Jesus Christ. That means that our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ has to be preeminent. Only when we find ourselves an authentic relationship with Christ only when we find ourselves genuinely in Christ can we be strengthened by Christ to find commitment or contentment with Christ alone. Amen. We find this to be the case with the Apostle Paul in the text. He has come to a place in his life where his often authentic relationship with the Lord has caused him to be content in whatsoever state he finds himself because he is in Christ. And he has already declared in this letter to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. And to reemphasize this, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, he says, But what things were gain to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. And so you can get a sense of his connection to Christ, the authenticity of his connection, the genuine connection that he has with the Lord Jesus Christ by way of relationship. His contentment 
is rooted in his relationship with Christ and not on human relationships and not on material resources. Relationship with the indwelling Christ is the only consistent relationship that we will ever have. That's all we got. It begins in time and it lasts throughout eternity. Contentment in Christ. For many of us, contentment, we are content because we have enjoyed years of consistent living. Whatever that might look like in your life, it's been consistent. And the consistency of the situation is our source of contentment. The relative certainty that we have, our expected routine, what you have gained over the years, the regularity of income, the accessibility of resources, many of us are fairly comfortable. But the test in life which God's allow through which we learn to be content is when you are caught in between or you are experiencing the extremes. And that's what Paul is talking about. Whether the regular routines and common condition, conditions begin to change, begin to waver, begin to decline, when that happens, Paul, that's what Paul is writing about. Not where we are right now, but what could be when, when the regular routines and the common conditions between, be, be, be of your life begin to waver. When we lose what we had, and common conditions begin to change. When we lose what we had, whether it's relationships or resources, and we have to settle for loneliness and empty cupboards, can you be content? When the personal freedoms and liberties that you've enjoyed all your life are gradually being restricted, can you be content? When the bountiful overflow in which you once took delight dries up and you go from deciding what you want to eat because you have options to eating what's available because you have no options. Or if you should go from having a closet full of clothes to select from to having by necessity to wear one set of clothing because that's all you own. Can you be content? Or if, if for some reason, by divine providence, you go from living into a, in a fully furnished apartment or home to living in a shelter for the homeless or in a box under a bridge, can you be content? This is the text. Paul is talking about learning to be content while living in the extremes or in the in-between. How to be content with little or with much. When you are full or when you are hungry. When you can celebrate or when you have to suffer. This theme of contentment is neither simple nor superficial. And it requires supernatural power. Amen. On last week, we talked about anchoring our faith in God. The scene was Acts 27, where the Apostle Paul found himself on board a cargo ship, which was being brutally battered by the wind and the waves of a severe storm that lasted for two weeks. In the midst of the darkness and chaos, Paul dropped his faith anchor. And we were encouraged last week by the teaching to drop our anchor of faith in God. So then here we are now anchored but still in the storm. In the text today, Philippians 4.11, Paul says, I have learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. In these verses before us, the Holy Spirit provides for us some clues and keys on learning to be content. And I want to lift three this morning for our consideration. First, to 
the key, a key, a clue to contentment is remembering the Lord's providence in your life. Contentment comes by remembering what God has done. Verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. The fact that the care of which Paul speaks that was provided by the Philippians has flourished again suggests that it had fallen off. And it had fallen off because of divine providence, because they lacked opportunity. There are seasons, my brothers and sisters, that God allows us to live through where contentment is learned. As we go through those seasons, however long it takes, we should remember that our Lord taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the key here is to remember that whatever your situation right now, that God is still in charge and that God is faithful. So you are still in God's hands. Paul knows even in this Philippian prison cell that he is still in God's hands. For many of us, that requires humble reflection, doesn't it? On what God has done for us already. And how God has brought you to the place that you now occupy. We can hear Job saying, after losing his wealth and his children and his friends and his health, the Lord gives and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so if you are like I am, then you know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, it was God's hand that brought you and protected you and provided for you. It is divine providence that has brought us to where we are right now. And as uncertain as things might seem to be right now, the fact is God has been good. Have I got a witness right there? God has been good. Like, like Job says, we, we can't charge God with evil because he has been good. And God is still sovereign. He has delivered us from situations much worse than what we are experiencing right now. And because he does not change, he is able to deliver us. But even if he does not, he is still God. And so in order to find contentment, Paul reminds us that we have to remember God's providence in our circumstances. And I want to suggest that we ask for strength to pray as our Lord prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. Tough lesson, right? Tough lesson. No joke. Secondly, contentment comes by refusing to focus on your circumstances. Y'all, we talked about you voting, you voted. There's a lot of anxiety about the outcome of the election. You voted. You've done what you can do. Now, be content. Don't focus by refusing to focus on the circumstances. Listen to verses 12, 11, and 12. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. Underline content, because that's the primary word. I know how to be a base, and I know how to abound everywhere. And in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, make it clear, I am not saying that contentment is trying to escape the reality of your particular situation, nor am I saying that contentment is complacency. I am saying that even in the midst of trials that challenge us and the troubles that are all around us and the afflictions that happen to us, that we can focus on the reality of our living God. Amen. Amen. Even though Paul's friends were few in number, his freedom was forfeited. And he's facing financial duress. 
He is saying, I have learned to be content. That's a strong, this is a strong, this is not a message for the weak. And, and I want to stick a pen here say it, and to say that this is, this is theoretical. I don't know how I would respond if I were forced to live in a box under a bridge. But I know that it is possible for me to have to live in a box under a bridge. And if I did have to live, forced to live, let me just say this. It's possible for you too. And can we just be real for a minute? There's a whole lot of people in America that never thought that they would be in the financial, social condition that they are in right now. There's some people with fine houses who had fine houses full of furniture who are now downsized, living in their cars, not knowing where to go. You ought to see some of the fine vehicles that line up behind food trucks these days. I'm talking reality here that we've got to learn how to be content. Amen. Amen. The word content in this context refers to positive self-sufficiency. It's inward adequacy that comes through the indwelling power of Jesus. That's why you need to be saved. That's why you need to be saved. That's why Christians can endure hardship like good soldiers. Because we have something on the inside that anchors us down. We have something on the inside that when life throws us down, we bounce right back. And the harder life throws us down, the higher we bounce back. You need something on the inside. You need something on the inside. This contentment is it, inward adequacy. It comes through the indwelling power of Christ. In other words, Paul has learned not to focus his attention on the circumstances in which he finds himself, but to trust God's ability to give him the stamina, to give him the necessary stuff to bounce back. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in times like these, we, uh, we need to learn the lessons on being content. We, 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 we use these times to refocus. To refocus means to put again into focus or to focus more sharply, to refocus the image until it's, it's very sharp. The psalmist put it like this, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. The psalmist understood that to magnify God is to bring him into focus. God, the Lord, is the object of our magnification. How can you get to the place where the Lord is not magnified? When you do, God wants to rearrange your situations to help you to refocus. If the Holy Spirit has taken up his permanent residency in your life and has given vision for your life, if you have set goals and have prayerfully worked toward fulfilling the vision of which God has predestined for you to and has planned for you in advance to do and has stored some blessings for you, if you are in pursuit, if in fact you have gotten caught up in your purpose and pursuing your plans and you have pursued your plans and you focused on your progress and your pursuit, well, beloved, God sends seasons in our lives where we need to refocus on the God who gave you what you have, who preserved you and blessed you and have brought you this far. You got your eyes on the blessing. God wants you to have your focus on the blessor. Amen. Amen. And so he helps us to refocus. Amen. When somebody compliments your material possessions, you're quick to say God is good. God wants to help you to understand that he's good even if you don't have material possessions. Refocus on God. Refocus on the God who saved you in the first place. 
through his profound demonstration of love. He gave his only begotten son whose spirit has given you new life and new hope and new citizenship in his kingdom and a promise of eternal inheritance. Contentment is learned when you refuse to focus on your circumstances and you learn to focus on God. Amen. Y'all got that? This last one, and I'm through. The third clue in the text is that contentment comes by relying on the Lord's strength. Verse 13, I can do all things. How? How? Who does what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The discipline of contentment is only possible through Christ who dwells within you. He strengthens you. It doesn't matter who you are, how much you have. You could be be wealthy with material possessions. You need something on the inside. You need Christ. That's why some people who have all of this stuff, if it's suddenly taken away, they can't cope because they don't have that something on the inside. Amen. You need something on the inside. The discipline of contentment is only possible through Christ who dwells within and who strengthens. Philippians 4.13 is one of the great Bible verses that we have. I can do all things through Christ. This is not a promise that Christians can have superpowers over and be invincible or immune to life challenges. No, this doesn't mean you can leap tall buildings in a single bound. That is not what this is talking about. Instead, it is a promise that you will have strength from the Lord to be faithfully and to endure the difficulties that arise in your life. You can do all things. He gives you strength to climb the mountains of opposition in your life. He gives you strength to cross the valleys of oppression in your life. He gives you strength to do what you need to do in order to survive and give him the glory. The Bible teaches that the believer can endure suffering and be content in any circumstance through Christ who strengthens. Jesus himself tells us, In this world, you will have tribulation. But he says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Amen. This is a short lesson, but it's a tough lesson. Paul said, I can through Christ. Listen to the language. This is the language of power. I can, not maybe I can. This is I can. This is the language of power. This is dynamic contentment. This is the power-filled Christian living. No matter what is going on around me, I know I can make it. Amen. This is victory over discouragement, victory over despair. This is victory over disappointment. This kind of strength comes through God's grace, which is sufficient for every situation and every circumstance. Grace provides to us God's strength when we are weak. Grace is God's power to bless us in every kind of trouble, y'all. Grace is God's proficiency, which empowers us for every task. It enables us to triumph in every trial and over every temptation. I am encouraged by the biblical witnesses who went through some tough times. You remember Job, he says, though he slay me, Yet will I trust in him. And let's remember the psalmist who said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, I will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains quake and with its swelling, there is a river whose stream may glad the city of God the holy place where the tabernacle of the Most High. Y'all know what the tabernacle of the Most High is? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the tabernacle. 
And what about the prophet Habakkuk who said, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vine, nor the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flocks may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stall, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will find joy in the God of my salvation. Thank God for the biblical witnesses that are testifying right now that God is able. And then there is Jesus, the one who was with God and who was God, who took and clothed himself with humanity, lived a sinless life. The one who was arrested in Gethsemane, suffered under Pontius Pilate, led up the road of sorrow with the weight of the cross on his back. He was crucified on Friday. He died to redeem us from the penalty of sin. He was buried in the borrowed tomb where he laid for three days. And then on the third day, God raised him from the dead. And I heard him say before he ascended into heaven, all power is given unto me. All power in heaven and on earth. Power, I give it to you. You've got power to witness. You've got power to wait on the Lord. You've got power to wrestle with the issues of life and overcome in the name of Jesus. Oh, my brothers and sisters, thank God for his power. It's the power of God that has brought you this far. You ought to give God some praise right now, right where you are. Give God some praise for his power. I don't know about you, but like the songwriter says, I'm learning to lean. I'm learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus, finding more power than I've ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. Are you learning to lean on Jesus today? Don't you thank God for your situation? Ask God to help you to be content in whatsoever situation you find yourself and go on and give God some praise. You can thank God for where you are right now. As a matter of fact, the songwriter says, I thank God for my mountains, and I thank him for my valleys. And I thank him for the storms he brought me through because through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I've learned to depend on his word. Come on, give God some praise. Come on, give God some praise. Come on, give God some praise. 